wasp. People love to hate them. And companies, they love to feel that fear. Actually, I want you to take a moment and picture a wasp. What is it doing? How big is it? What does it look like? Now, what if I told you that I could almost guarantee that whatever you were picturing was wrong? A caricature. A stereotype. A limited lens on the incredible diversity that is the world of wasps. I'm Devin Boker, and this is The Wildlife. To filter through the swarm, the buzz, the bad puns, I've enlisted some help. I'm Eric R. Eaton. My pronouns are he and him. Bug Eric on Twitter or X, or whatever it's called nowadays. He's the author of Insectpedia, a brief compendium of insect lore, Wasp, the astonishing diversity of a misunderstood insect, lead author of the Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America, and co-author of Insects Did It First. He's also the contributor to several other books, including The Butterfly Gardener's Guide and Wild in the City, a guide to Portland's natural areas. His empathy for the squeamish and scared, knack for identification of mystery bugs, and his accurate, jargon-free explanation of insect biology have made him a leading figure in popular entomology, an expert through and through, and yet the path he's taken has been... Relatively unconventional, honestly. Uh, I mean, I did, I grew up as an only child. I think that has a lot to do with it. I felt a little bit like an outcast among my peers. And so I kind of gravitated towards other species that were, that are, you know, also outcasts. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm 62 years old, so you know, my my favorites were things like you know uh, snakes and bats and sharks. That was long before they had their own week on Discovery. Started in 1988, by the way, and of course, um, you know, uh, in, insect spiders, that kind of thing. My my mom says that, that, that ever since kindergarten, I kind of went through the whole animal kingdom and then just settled on insects. Uh, and I do remember my kindergarten teacher was a gifted artist and she drew a, a picture of a trapdoor spider on the chalkboard one day. And her explanation of its behavior was really, really captivating. His spark animal. Side note, I'd love to hear about your spark animals or moments. So if you've got one you want to share, email me or message me. You can do that at hello at the wildlife.blog or on any of my social accounts. TikTok, Instagram in particular, that's at Devin the Nature Guy. In, in terms of kind of uh, sparking a curiosity about other organisms and, and how fascinating that is and what role they play in their ecosystem and what impact they have on, on humanity. So I did study entomology at Oregon State for, for four years. I did not get a degree and um, the, the reason for that, I think, was that when I first started out, the, 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 the curricula put you through the hard sciences right away. So I wasn't even able to take an entomology course until my sophomore year. Instead, I was taking calculus, chemistry, that kind of thing. And uh, I avoided statistics and things at, <laughs> at all costs. <laughs> but uh, I felt like this was, you know, this barrier that was put up between, you know, this abstraction, this uh, obsession with you know, quantitative analysis and, and making paper ecosystems, you know, ecosystem models, that kind of thing put up this barrier between me and the flesh and blood things that got me excited uh, about, that got me excited about insects in the first place and, and wildlife in general. And, and so, uh, you know, I wish someone had told me back then that I'm, I'm a writer and a science communication person. I'm not an actual scientist. <laughs> My brain is not cut out for that. I respect the sciences greatly and I wouldn't trade what I learned in college, but by the same token, I'm not enjoying how it's being applied in a lot of cases, um, you know, to, you know, to sustain these uh, industrialized systems that are clearly unsustainable at this point. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for my education, but I'm also grateful that I can take a step back from it when I need to to address these these larger issues. You know, I, I can really appreciate what you say. It, it's it sounds to me like you you are one of many who kind of prefers like the naturalistic approach uh, rather than like the the way that I feel like it has become commonplace now where it's, it's 
computational and it's it's kind of distance from like you said the flesh and blood it's it's a little distance from the uh the nature of it yeah it yeah exactly starts to become everything's through a human lens and a human use so wasp in particular it <laughs> seems to it seems to be that you have a like that kind of is like your focus area or or maybe the one you're most passionate about is that is that correct yeah that's probably true i mean if i'm honest in my youth I probably started collecting wasps because no one could call me a sissy for catching something that could fight back. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, but the more I learned about them, about their diversity, about their behaviors, the more fascinated I became with them in, the, in a much more legitimate sense. And so I've kind of followed them a little more closely than I have other groups of insects, but insects in general, I have to say, I'm still a, a, a generalist as well uh, and i'm excited i get most excited about getting other people excited at the top i may have hinted that there was way more to wasp diversity than you've likely ever imagined heck more than i've ever imagined i asked eric just how many species there are well this is going to seem like i'm dodging the question but increasingly our definition of, of species is becoming more and more flimsy now, the traditional definition of a species is essentially a group of organisms that either cannot or will not reproduce with another group of organisms. Now, that's kind of murky in today's biology. Today, we're learning through analysis of, of mitochondrial, nucleic, and, and regular DNA that things that appear identical are not. There's a lot of cryptic species in there. We're still discovering species new to science. Uh, that's not necessarily going out and catching things that, that we've never seen before, but it means going back into you know, museum specimens and analyzing them at a molecular DNA level and recognizing, oh, there's several other species going on here. Sometimes it's the opposite. You, rec you, you look at several species and it goes, no, these are all the same thing. To complicate things even further, some species can only be recognized behaviorally. Fireflies, for example, many species can only be recognized by their flash patterns and in every other regard they're identical so there's a lot going on that is like okay well so what is a species then uh, but right now there's the potential for wasps to be the most diverse organism on the planet most diverse animal at least that's how profound this is and I want to go back to, you know, the, the, uh, for a second about why, why do we hate wasps? Why, you know, why do people perceive that we're being attacked all the time by them? One, the major reason is because when you hear the word wasp, most of us, the first thing we think of are yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps. Okay, well, what do all, all of those, what do those three have in common? They're social. So when we encounter a nest of them, we're immediately outnumbered. And that, even for somebody like me who studies wasps, that's a bit intimidating right away. That's understandable. That's a normal human instinctive reflex. These are also wasps that are the most urbanized. So they're the most common kind of wasp in situations where, where we're going to encounter them in the city, in the suburbs, uh, and in our homes or just outside of our homes. So they, they, they put their nests up under the eaves of our houses. Why? Because our houses look like cliff faces and rock overhangs where they normally would put their nest. So there, we do not, you know, besides we, the fact that we don't want to get stung, uh, uh, that's understandable for a variety of reasons. We also don't like it when another species exploits us and, and kind of takes over what we perceive as our resources, our home, our food. That's, that's and again, a basic animal reflex. We want to have possession over things, but in nature, there is no ownership. And in, you know, we've been conditioned in the economic sense that we do have ownership over things. We don't, uh, you know, maybe products, but, but not the natural world. But the thing is, the social wasps are a minuscule fraction of wasp diversity. The overwhelming majority of wasps are solitary. They're very tiny. Remember, yellow jackets and whatnot are about a quarter of an inch or usually larger. Most wasp diversity is under five millimeters. In other words, it's a bit of a confirmation observation bias type thing. Some wasps are the smallest insects known. 
to, to the smallest one being slightly larger maybe than uh, the largest one-celled organism. He's talking about fairy flies. They can fly through the eye of the needle. Now, I had to look it up. The largest bacterium is Theo margarita namibiensis. Um, namibiensis. Namib namibiensis? Yes, Theo margarita namibiensis. It's the largest bacterium reaching a diameter of, get this, 0 0.75 millimeters. We're not talking micrometers, millimeters. Now, technically, and I just learned this, the largest single cell organism is mind-blowingly larger than you might think. Valonia ventricosa. It's a species of algae with a diameter that ranges typically from one to four, get this, centimeters. That's 0 0.4 to 1.6 inches it is among the largest unicellular species on earth and as far as we know anywhere else so we haven't done a good job as entomologists of communicating wasp diversity to the general public yeah no that's that's fascinating i had no idea and so it kind of it it made me think about something just in terms of like you think that a couple of things might be the same species and then you later determine that they're not the same species and I, it's a thought that's been kind of on the back of my mind for a while. I remember a few years back, I talked to Dr. Uh, Tim Caro. Um, he's at UC Davis and he had done some research um, to try to figure out why zebras have stripes and had kind of concluded that it had to do with disrupting uh, setsy fly um, patterns and things. And how, you know, for a long time, we thought it was because it confused lions, but we realized that after you actually think about how a lion interprets the world visually they can't even see the stripes they can merely see the outline of the zebra on like the horizon um and so it makes me wonder you know how many things are there that are are different and you know this species can perceive each other as different or something through their perception but we're looking at it from our human lens and going oh that's the same that's the same that's the same um yeah, how much is being missed there? That's it. That's an interesting question. I had no idea that the smallest wasps were that small. I'm still just stuck on that. That's that's fascinating. Yeah, the the, the majority of, of of wasps have what is called a, a parasitoid lifestyle, and a, a parasitoid meaning a parasite that invariably kills the host. And for these tiny wasps, they carry out the egg, larva, and pupa stage of their lives all within the confines of the egg of another insect. They're that tiny. And 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 there's a, several families, entire families of wasps, not just species, but you go up, you know, at the genus level and then the family level, there's there's whole families of wasps that have this lifestyle. And they're in some instances competing with each other for the same, uh, same resource, the same uh, egg. But uh, yeah, just insane. You know, people can kind of visually differentiate between when they see a wasp and when they see a bee, at least they think. Um, what what are some of the uh, key differences between the two? Are are they related at all? They are related. They're, they're in the same order. So you might be familiar with this, but we classify species. I mean, as humans, we just in general really like to organize things like really a lot. And our system for organizing life is called a taxonomic system. We follow kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Kingdom being in the broadest category, species being most specific. Species, specific. Genus is like a genre of animal, and the species is more specific. Now, when talking about animals, it's kingdom, animalia. Surprise, surprise, they're all animals. From then, it's just about what they have in common. I'll give you an example. A phylum might be chordata and what they have in common is a backbone beneath that you'll have the classes now in chordata there's a variety you might have mammalia the mammals reptilia the reptiles aves the birds and then you get more specific as you go so bees and wasps and ants are all in the hymenoptera the thing that unites them is that they have two pairs of wings and a narrow waist so in that sense, yes. And the more we learn about the evolution of wasps and, and bees, the more we understand ants, the more we understand that probably bees and ants are still wasps themselves. So they certain wasps were certainly the precursors to to bees and ants. And 
bees arguably went back to a vegetarian lifestyle, if you will, in that they provide pollen and nectar as food for their offspring, whereas the majority of wasps, and but again, there's so many exceptions, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. the majority of wasps provide animal matter as food for their their offspring, either in, the, in a living state or or in rare cases in a deceased uh, state for them. So so yeah, they, they are related in that sense. I, I don't like to go into differences beyond that because it it plays into this you know this scenario of oh bees are good, wasps are bad. Uh, and and the same with with moths and butterflies. Oh, butterflies are wonderful. Moths are the things that eat your clothes. You know, well, no, it's 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 a lot more complicated than that. We like we like simple, straightforward things, but that's not the way insects work at all. <laughs> Our brains just really like categories. Have you not noticed that at a lot of in coffee shops, in particular, you go to leave a tip, and to leave a tip, you have to cast a vote. In fact, you're more likely to leave a tip if you are making a vote. So they, they, they know this, and so they'll say things like, which is your favorite droid from Star Wars? Is it BB-8 or R2-D2? And, and you are more likely to, to put cash in the box because you are picking. And it's why some questions, like for example, what color is a tennis ball, drive people crazy, even though it's not green, it's not yellow, it's something different. Or, you know, the countless social media trends like, is this dress blue with black stripes or white with gold stripes? Now, I sat for a while trying to think of a natural, you know, artful, not awkward segue to this next question, but there was just really no way around it. So here it goes. What is up with their legs? Like, have you, have you ever, <laughs> have you ever noticed like a, a mud dauber or something flying around and his legs are just dangling behind? They seem so inefficient, so not aerodynamic, so weird is why i asked eric again super diverse so you've got things like i think when you you see a mud dauber or a paper wasp in flight you notice those hind legs uh trailing because it makes in that orientation it makes them more aerodynamic i suspect um so it's they're still functional legs doing leg things uh, but it, when they're in flight, they need to be in a position where it's not causing too terribly much drag for the insect, or maybe the insect wants to fly more slowly and it'll orient its legs accordingly. If it's, if it's gleaning, for example, it's looking for, for food as uh, you'll see wasps hovering around plants and, and briefly inspecting them and then going on to another plant. They're hunting if they're doing that. And so they're looking for, for uh, a host if they're a parasitoid, or they're looking for prey if they're a social wasp when they're doing that. So they can use their legs as a tactile thing to detect prey as, or, or a host as well. Um, but the, the basic defining character of, of true wasps is a wasp waist, which is a constriction between the, the, the thorax where the wings and legs are attached, a constriction between that body part and the abdomen which is the end of the the rear end of the insect and so that constriction allows a great deal of mobility for the abdomen so it allows the abdomen to maneuver to sting a host or a prey item uh, or to sting an adversary if it's a social wasp uh, and so having that flexibility and maneuvering the abdomen is is really key to wasp success uh, the the precursors to wasps, the, the sawflies and horntails, which are vegetarians in their youth, by the way, um, they have the abdomen broadly joined to the, to the thorax. So it's not nearly as maneuverable as, as it is in, in true wasps. So that's a, a, a good way to, uh, to differentiate real wasps from their, their ancestors, which are the, the sawflies and what have you. But, you know, it's, we're still learning about how these how these things evolve from each other yeah i'm glad you mentioned the uh the constriction there because someone someone brought that up yesterday too about how it almost looks like like what can even go on in that space yeah. it looks like they're wearing a corset and i'm like yeah yeah it's like a bee with a corset yeah i guess you can, <laughs> it's a little bit what it looks like yeah the elementary elementary canal goes through there the um blood flows through there although it's not in a vessel like you would think uh, generally speaking, it's free flowing through through the cells of the body. The tracheal system goes through there as well. So 
um, those are the major things going on between the the the, the thorax and the and the abdomen but things like the reproductive structures they're all in the abdomen digestive structures all in the abdomen of course there's something else that everyone is probably wondering and it has to do with the stinger perhaps you've heard that the distinguisher between bees and wasps is that a bee loses its stinger and a wasp can sting multiple times but is that true that's a broad generalization that applies only to to honeybees uh, which the workers do lose their sting if because it's the sting is barbed if you look at the the sting and it's the sting by the way not stinger I, I learned that in in researching my book on wasps okay. that the sting is huh. in in the bee if you look at, at under a microscope is barbed so like a an arrow point or a, or a harpoon point so that it 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 can't be pulled back out again very easily and so what happens is sure. the the sting is attached to to a venom gland, and when the bee departs, the sting tears out the venom gland and other and some vital organs along with it. And so, a, a bee that has stung you, a honey bee that has stung you, is destined to die. Let's just have a quick moment of silence. <laughs> now wow. there are. That's, that's there are sad. some there are some social wasps that also have barbed stingers. They aren't necessarily barbed in in the same way as a honeybee sting is. So it can be withdrawn in most cases, but not always. And so it gets stuck. It has the same thing: yanks out the venom gland and what have you. I've had that happen with a yellow jacket once. Uh, but in, in some tropical. Uh, places there are wasps where that they definitely have a barbed sting and that's their you know they normally die after stinging uh so that you can't say it's only honeybees or, or excuse me it's only bee it's, it's all bees and wasps differ in this way that's not true at all now eric has mentioned honeybees a few times at this point so i think now is a good time to chime in on that the bees that we think of as honeybees are not the native bees so often the messaging about saving our bees can get a little bit mixed up about honey and crops and, and, and native species. See, honeybees were brought from Europe by settlers who, in their hubris, thought that there couldn't possibly be any bees in the New World. And boy, did they turn out to be wrong. Again, most wasps are, are solitary. The sting is not barbed because they're using it to paralyze or in rare cases, kill their their host. And so it's a matter of controlling the, the host in some fashion so that it's not fighting back. Uh, and, and the venom is designed to do that. It's not, except for social wasps, venom is not designed to be a, a self-defense mechanism. It's designed to influence the host. Couple more differences. Some of these wasps I'm telling you that do not sting I'm uh, meaning they don't sting people. <laughs> There's they're still stinging, sure, yeah, stinging yeah. their host to immobilize it in, in many cases. But mm -hmm. uh, now to your second question about ovipositors, the sting is a weaponized ovipositor. In the history of wasps, the sting evolved from the egg laying organ, the ovipositor. So again, this this explains why only female wasps sting of those that, that yeah, do sting. Okay. Yeah. So if you see uh, a long tail or a spear-like thing coming out of the rear of a, of a wasp, that's an ovipositor. It's not a stinger. <laughs> okay, stingers okay. are stingers are almost always retractable. So you never see them until it's deployed, right? And causing you oh, pain. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, you, know, you don't want that thing to be in the way uh, when you're flying around doing other wasp things. Uh, so you retract your stinger. For an ovipositor, it may be really, really long because the host it is trying to reach is buried inside a tree trunk or inside some other inaccessible mm -hmm. cavity that it has to get into. So an ovipositor is essentially, it's an egg laying deployment device, correct? It's, correct. It's like, a, it's like if you had a, if you're giving a, a whatever it might be, the host, it might be, uh, I believe tarantulas in some cases, um, plants, uh, it's to essentially inject um, um, the eggs beneath the surface, right? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, in the, in the case of, of tarantula hawks, the, the egg is coming out of another orifice in the abdomen. The, the, the tarantula hawk does sting the tarantula to paralyze it. So it's easier to, to uh, drag the spider away to where you want to st- stuff it. Uh, for your for your nest and your offspring <laughs> but see i i know that maybe talking about it sometimes can be a bit frustrating because it's like well 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 and this and this but see that's what i love about the natural world animal kingdom and insects in particular is that you can't really paint it with a broad stroke you know you you go to say one thing and it's like well but it but in the, in this species it's it's not quite so that's that is actually really um, interesting. There, so I saw a picture or I took a picture a couple of days ago, and I'm trying to find it because so in this moment and you can't really see this. I was showing Eric a picture of a gall that I saw on a hike at a local park. The the gall you just showed me, by the way, <clears throat> excuse me, is on goldenrod, and it's caused by a fly. So a gall can mm-hmm. be caused by several different or can be caused by any one of several different agents. It might be an insect. It might be a mite. It might be a fungus. Mm-hmm. Could be a bacteria. So lots of different agents can cause a gall. But a gall essentially is a abnormal growth on a plant that is induced by one of these agents. And we're still not sure exactly what is causing that growth to, to happen. Some schools of thought are that, well, it's it's the act of inserting the egg, and in, in, I'll, I'll speak only of wasp galls at, at the moment. Some people think a gall is caused with the insertion of the, the egg, that, that the female wasp is also inserting some kind of hormonal chemical, perhaps, or something that mimics a plant hormone and causes it to, in, you know, cause this growth. Still, others think it could be the act of feeding in the larval stage, a combination of both or even something else entirely. Galls, by the way, are not generally economically important. There are some galls of of seeds that impact like the almond industry, that kind of thing. Pecans, uh, some of the nut orchards are are adversely affected by certain kinds of of, uh, seed gall makers. But in general, galls don't seem to have much of an impact on the plant. It's yeah, it's a sink for nutrients. So the gall receives a disproportionate amount of nutrients because it's it's you know the wasp is trying to harvest the, these these nutrients, as, capture them as food for its offspring that is living in the gall. And sometimes there's only one offspring in there. Sometimes there's multiple uh, offspring in a gall. So yeah, but it, it doesn't otherwise impact the plant. It looks like it's a tumor or something. But to quote Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's not a tumor. It's not a tumor. We underestimate the ability of plants to absorb attacks like that uh, or to absorb herbivory like sawfly larvae, which sawflies are one of the precursors of of true wasps. Uh, They have caterpillar-like larvae that can defoliate. They defoliate our rose bushes in our front yard, make them look terrible. But every year the roses come back, you know, uh, so they look hideous for a while. Eh, You know, they're, you know, What's happening in our yard is what should be happening. Our plants are being eaten by other organisms. <laughs> you know, obviously we want to mitigate some of those effects if we're growing food, but you know, overall, if you're not seeing any damage to your plants, something's wrong. Uh, and and you know, we don't, we we're not conditioned to frame our expectations that way. Uh, but yeah, so galls. If you see galls on your roses or or, or your oak tree. Uh, those those two families of plants, by the way, oaks and, and things of the rose family are the most often the host for gall making wasps. Eh, let them be they're, they're, uh, you know They may not look right, but they're not impacting your plant. I think that that kind of lends to a, a, an interesting topic of conversation in that 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 instinct of, of kind of destroy. Um, and I, and I say, so like I was thinking yesterday about how, so my grandparents, they used to live in um, a rural, a rural part of Texas. And I remember talking to them on the phone and they'd be like, we've been killing all these snakes mm. on our property. And, and I'm like, guys, why are you? And I'm like, why are you doing that? Why are you killing on snakes? And well, they just, they won't stop showing up. And every time we see a snake, we kill them. And I'm thinking, inter- like, kind of weird that there's that many snakes and things. And they're like, yeah, and we've been killing every possum we see. And I'm like, well, the possums sometimes 
control the snakes. So if you don't want the snakes, you should leave the possums. And why are you killing the possums? And like, so what are you killing the possums for? Just for a moment here, like what, what exactly? And I, you know, and I've shared this story before with other people and, you know, the reaction is, oh my gosh, I can never, I would never be killing possums. I would never kill snakes. But then when it comes to wasp or something, doing absolutely nothing in your yard, <laughs> you know, the instinct is, let me get the can of raid real quick. Um, and I just, I wonder what that is, you know, that, that um, lack of hesitance to, to just destroy insect life um, in particular. Well, I mean, we're, mm -hmm. you know, we're animals ourselves. I mean, let's, you know, I mean, that's, that's something we, that's another thing, another problem we have is that we think, you know, you know, when we say, you know, oh, he's an animal, it's not <laughs> right. a compliment, right? But, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, we, we are animals and, and we should really embrace that. And because of that, you know, we have biological drives that, you know, survival instincts and, and back in our ancestry, we've carried that with us. I mean, yeah, yeah, if you stepped on a viper in, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, back mm -hmm. in the day, you know, that could kill you. Uh, so you, you learn to, you know, associate certain characteristics with things that can hurt you. And that's carried forward. The, the difference now is that, that we know better, but we haven't been good at educating people mm -hmm. uh, about how we know better. And uh, we've, as you mentioned earlier, you know, there's profit to be made in villainizing things. The other thing with regards to insects is that agriculture tends to set the tone for, for what happens everywhere else. So you have these vast monocultural plots now in industrial agriculture. And the only way to suppress insects in a, in a situation like that is through application of chemicals. There's not enough room anywhere uh, for natural in, you know, controls like wasps and beetles and things to get into the field to, affect mm -hmm. natural pest control. So then that trickles down to the consumer end of things where we're conditioned, okay, the way you the way you control things is is to to apply uh, chemicals to it. Uh, we we have a monoculture in the yeah. in, at home in the form of our lawns. Okay. So, you know, you know, we yeah, we've we've taken the agricultural model and applied it mm -hmm. to places where it should never be applied. If we can break free from that at our at our individual mm -hmm household level, that's a great start. Now, I hope I'm not alone in this, but on more than one occasion, I have found myself in complete awe of wasp and their ability to do paper mache where I just can't. Similar to birds building nests without hands, like what? How are you how are you doing that with your face pliers? I mean just just think about it. Think about it. No, not the birds anymore. The wasp in general. You, you look at their nest like a big paper wasp nest. This thing is giant. It's, it's intricately structured on the inside. And how? How are they doing this? How long does it take? Surprisingly quickly. We have, well, we had a, a, a small paper wasp nest under the, uh, under the door frame in our back door. And I went out there the other day and, and it had been abandoned. And it looked like some vertebrate had gotten to the nest and torn out some cells. I can't. I, I need to find out from people who know better than I what could have done that. But the wasps weren't there anymore. And I thought, oh, that's a shame. And then I noticed that they had started another nest further away under the eve of our our house. And it already had three cells in it. And this isn't a matter of a couple of days, probably. I went out there the other day. It's got four or five now. So they're... Mm -hmm. that's what I find remarkable is the, the, their plasticity in being yeah. able to their plasticity and persistence. Okay. If you're going to destroy this nest, I'm going to go make another mm -hmm. one. I mean, if that, if it's like a tornado hit our house, you know, we're saying, okay, fine. I'm going to rebuild. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we think that's a human kind of thing, right. But it, it, it also trickles down to that level. Um, but how do they do it? Well, they, they scrape, woody plant fibers or wood fibers off of uh, dead plants, uh, dead uh, trees that have been bleached by the sun, that kind of thing, old, old fences, uh, the sides of barns and outbuildings. They scrape pieces of that off, chew it up and, and mix it with their saliva into this pulp that they then take back to the nest and make these uh, very 
thin paper strips out of it. And when it dries, it's extremely durable. Uh, it, it, I mean, we think that's the other thing. We think insects are so fragile and the things that they make are so fragile. Oh, forget that. They're really, really durable. And, and so they can persist. Uh, you know, even the ones that are built outdoors out in the elements can persist for a couple of years or so. Uh, they're just that durable. Uh, the, the pedestal, what the nest, is, the paper wasp nest is suspended from is often coated in some kind of glandular secretion that repels ants because ants are the major enemy for, for these wasps uh, because they get into the nest and kill the larvae. Um, so, uh, you know, how do they decide who goes and fetches the, the, the paper and stuff? That's, that's up for debate. Uh, you know, in, in yellow jackets, there is a dedicated queen that she, she starts the nest, but then her, her daughters, uh, the workers are all female. Uh, they, they take over those duties. And, and so there's a division of labor in that. In, in paper wasps, uh, any female is capable of founding a nest. Uh, and, but again, the daughters of the foundress uh, perform the paper making uh, once the nest is established. They go and get food to feed their, their sisters that are still larvae. So it's, it's, it's a division of labor uh, and and they're they're instinctively programmed to know how to do that, each of those tasks. That is just fascinating. Like every every single individual aspect of that, at least to me, and I hope the people who will eventually be listening is that is just fascinating because it just brings about so many questions and there's questions that just feel like you could almost never answer in some ways. Like instinct is always something that's confused me. You know how does that work? And, and how, do, you know, how do, how do things just know that this is what to do and this is how they spend their life? And then, you know, that, that's just, uh, very intriguing. And yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes you see the size of these and then you look at the ratio of the body size of one of the individuals compared to what they construct. And, and to think that it's essentially starting from something that they're chewing up and they, in a very small space, that is just, uh. But well, there's usually, usually a lot of them yeah. Do, yeah. doing that work though. So <laughs> yeah. Do they, so uh, do they commute? I, I've heard a lot about like bee communication and the form mm. of like dancing patterns. very similar to like fireflies and things, you know, just like dancing and stuff. Do, do wasps do the same, the same thing? Well, the social wasps definitely communicate with each other through a couple of, of ways that the, the um, most common way I think, excuse me, is, uh, is trophallaxis, which is mutual feeding. And so somebody brings back a prey item and uh, it's further divided among the, the workers and then they take it and feed their offspring, the, the, or their, their siblings that are still in the larval stage. Mm -hmm. The larva will regurgitate a sweet substance uh, to indicate that, okay, I'm hungry, feed me. And so there's this exchange of, of food between both both the adults with each other and between adults and and larval uh, stages there. So there's that's the major way communication happens in most insect societies. There's other things exchanged with that. Microbes probably are exchanged that way as well. Um, the other thing is just straight up bullying. In the case of paper wasps, the, the foundress, in order to maintain her reproductive superiority or, or reproductive um, monopoly is the word I'm looking for. Uh, she bullies any, you know, the, her, the founder, any other co-foundress of that nest into submission to the point where the physiology of that subordinate uh, shrinks its ovaries. So it can't, wow. yeah, right? Um, now, once, once they're producing the the, the, once the dominant female is producing daughters, she doesn't have that problem. They, they understand their subordination to her because they haven't made it yet themselves. Sure. And so they're still virgins. So they're, they're, they're doing work instead of, you know, instead of looking for a mate at the end of the nest cycle, uh, that changes and they all disperse and each female is trying to find a, a mate at that point. But um, yeah, so it, yeah, it's, it, it can be, <laughs> you know, either a mutual feeding or straight up aggression in some cases. There's a par you know, social parasite species of social wasps that infiltrate the nests of other species, kill off the queen, and then somehow are able to, probably through 
pheromones mimicry mm -hmm. um able to convince the workers that okay i'm still the queen <laughs> um and you are raising my offspring now just like you have been raising uh, your own uh, so there's a so much complexity yeah it, it's just it is mind-boggling so clearly there's a lot of diversity amongst wasp and it's far more difficult than i originally bargained for to summarize them Nevertheless, I asked Eric to share some of his all-time favorite behavioral examples, specifically how they fit into the bigger picture and how they interact with other species. Well, we think of, let's start with pollination. Uh, I mean, sure. we think of bees as, as the chief pollinators, but um, if you like figs, for example, you can thank wasps for that because there's, there's these tiny, tiny wasps called fig wasps that are the sole uh, pollinators of, of figs. And it gets even weirder than that because there are some species that are parasitoids of the tiny fig wasps. <laughs> but basically, uh, figs are, are designed specifically to accommodate these wasps and no other pollinators. The, the, the flowers are concealed in this structure uh, that eventually becomes the fig. It's not a fruit. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's like the astrodome inside of which you've got mm. a bunch of flowers. Uh, uh, in the dark, <laughs> and so these these fig wasps are able to enter the the fig through a tiny hole and and go ahead and pollinate it. Now, commercial figs are not produced in that manner, by the way. Um, they don't require pollination. That's my understanding. Uh, but wild figs, which are the the foundation of a lot of tropical ecosystems that feed monkeys and and birds and rodents and all kinds of other animals, uh, really important to have those wasps. Orchids. There are some orchids that are only pollinated by wasps. And in some cases, the orchids have evolved to mimic the female wasp. And so it attracts only the male wasps. And the male thinks he's getting lucky. And in fact, all he's doing is pollinating this orchid instead. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't learn the first time either because he has to go visit another orchid, right? To, to yeah. If yeah. pollination. <laughs> I won't, I won't extrapolate to humans, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, and, and there's, there's other plants for which wasps disperse the seeds. It's called mm. v Vespico cori. Uh, and I learned about this after I wrote the, the wasp book, unfortunately, because I think this is so fascinating. Um, but we've known for a long time that, that ants, disperse seeds for a lot of, of plants. But in, in some cases, social wasps do the same thing. And the plant produces this coating on its seeds that is, is full of protein and fats. And so the, the wasp goes, oh, here's a resource I can take back to the nest. And so it yanks the seed and this capsule out and goes, and then it lands somewhere, cuts off the protein part, drops the seed. So it's taken the seed away from the plant. And then it takes that protein uh, thing called an eliasome takes that back to the nest to feed its its larvae. So uh, there's that. Many uh, many of the yellow jacket species have evolved to be scavengers instead of predators. So they are important mm -hmm. in decomposing carcasses um, of vertebrate animals, especially the the smaller carcasses that scaven other scavengers might overlook. Um, what else? Well control of other insects is the biggest one. So if it weren't for wasps, sure. we would have even more problems with uh, crop pests and things than, than we already do, uh, or garden pests. So, you know, uh, aphids, wasps have an association with aphids in the, well, first of all, some of them use aphids as hosts. Some, some really tiny wasps do, some of the larger wasps still uh, grab them and cart them off as food for their for their uh, offspring in a nest somewhere. But aphids also, in the course of feeding, produce this substance called honeydew. It's really sweet, it's like nectar. And so in, in times when there's not much nectar available from flowers because they're not blooming, so early spring and late fall in particular, aphids fill that nectar void. And so, you know, when you think uh, you might wanna control your aphids, you know, think again, because they're, they're keeping some of your really valuable uh, pest control agents energized until they can affect pest control and until flowers start blooming and then they can go to that. So, uh, so yeah, a, a shout out to aphids as being uh, uh, not just 
not a pest as much as a, a real bridge for uh, insects that, that need energy. I've seen it a couple of times with like ants doing um, <clears throat> like aphid farming yep. and stuff. And I always just think that's so fascinating to, to just kind of sit yep. and watch for a while, them kind of going up and down the row of the aphids and stuff. And it's just, it's like, man, you know, we, we think we're so complicated <laughs> and so different and, <laughs> and then here they are, you know, they're, they're doing their own thing. Um, right. You know, I, I heard something before and I don't know if it was accurate or not. Um, I remember I was working, oh gosh, it was when I was working at Armand Bayou Nature Center down in, in Houston. Um, and I remember one of the people there um, mentioning how they thought that they had heard somewhere that that sometimes when um, plants were being eaten or attacked by certain insects that they could release uh, chemical signals that wasps could interpret and then would come and not necessarily like defend, but then they would come and then they would find the things there. And then that could be a potential food source and stuff. Is that, is that a, is that an accurate thing? That is, that is absolutely true. That's uh, fascinating. So, sometimes, yeah, sometimes truth is stranger than fiction and, and, uh, better than any conspiracy theory. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We, we, well, plants, yeah, we, plants are a lot more complicated than we give them credit for also. And so one of the ways they, they defend themselves is they'll, they'll clump their, their, the, the pest that's attacking them. So they'll, they'll dis, disperse defensive chemicals to most of their foliage, but they'll leave one patch that's not defended. And so the, the population of the pest insect will gravitate towards that undefended patch of foliage. And then they'll, release these these chemicals saying oh by the way guys we're being attacked and and other nearby plants of the same species will recognize that and start bolstering their own defenses ahead of time but also those i think they're called alimones if i'm remembering the term correctly these chemicals that are airborne they are intercepted by by some of these parasitoid wasps that we're talking about that that will be alerted and go oh okay I need to fly over here to find my host. And, and so, yeah, they are directed by the, the plants in many cases to the host they are targeting. Uh, that makes perfect sense because you want to be as efficient as possible in, in finding your, your host. So if you can tune in to plants under distress, oh, I mean, that's a great strategy. I just, I love that more and more it becomes irrefutable that everything is just so interconnected and that a lot of the interactions mm. and things between different life forms and even across species are, are, you know, they're, they're almost imperceptive to humans, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. And they're there, they're complicated and they're just perceived differently and, and, and communicated differently. And that's just, I don't know. I think it's a beautiful thing. Let me give one more yeah. uh, example of, of a symbiosis there some of the parasitoid wasps, uh, especially the, the Braconidae and Ichneumonidae, um, the females, when they lay an egg into the host, they're also inserting, well, first of all, they often insert a venom that, that again, they don't use for self-defense, so it's not applicable to us, it's not dangerous to us, but it, it, it briefly immobilizes the host so it's not fighting back. So she lays an egg uh, on the an anesthetized <laughs> animal, usually a caterpillar, she inserts her egg. She also inserts a virus, and this virus is peculiar to to that wasp. It's also peculiar to the host because it suppresses the immune system of the host so that it doesn't recognize there's a new agent inside its body. Okay, it goes another step further in many cases in that it it hijacks the brain of the host such that once the wasp larva has matured and is about to exit the, the host, the still living host goes, oh, okay, I am now the guardian of this parasitoid. And it, <laughs> and so the, the wasp larva exits the host, spins a cocoon under it. And meanwhile, this virus is continuing to work the brain of the, the host caterpillar or beetle, whatever it is. And when danger threatens the, the wasp cocoon, the, the host is thrashing about, you know, in, in a defensive manner to scare off the potential attacker. And the host 
may or may not recover from that, by the way. If it does recover, it's not going to be able to reproduce. But uh, in many cases, it does eventually die. Uh, but it, it holds on <laughs> just long enough to defend the cocoon of this wasp that has been its parasitoid. <laughs> that is, that is. You can't see me right here, but let me tell you, I was flabbergasted. <laughs> that is just mind blowing. Oh my gosh. That's yeah, I'm crazy. really glad I'm not oh, a caterpillar, wow. I tell you. <laughs> wow. Oh, geez. Just when you think, just when you think it's not going get, <laughs> to get crazier than that. Jeez. I had no idea. That is that is just fascinating. I really hope people appreciate that in the same way that I do. Because that's that is just remarkable. That is that is just crazy. <laughs> right? Wow. It, it sounds completely made up, you know, or something that you'd see on you know, like The Last of Us or, you know, like some kind of like sci-fi zombie-esque kind of thing or something. But um, no, that's where do you, crazy. Where do you think the writers get their ideas? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in, in, I mean, in the, in the Last of Us, I have not seen that, by the way, but I, I, I've, I've communicated with people who have. And it's it's totally based on on a, yeah. a type of fungus that infests ants and other insects and, and, and controls it, controls the host behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember right after that, the, the game had been out for a long time, but then the show premiered and a few episodes had come out and I had students kind of coming into my, to my wildlife class and they're like, could this happen? <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, so I, I had to spend a couple of days kind of completely paused on curriculum and stuff to like talk about like that kind of fungus and how that all works and stuff and it was remarkable um, but yeah people were like could this actually happen do we need to worry about this as eric and i continue talking one thing became clear humans have a perspective issue and rather than frame the rest of this conversation around why you should care or you know what's in it for me we decided to focus on all the amazing things that wasp do that we just happen to directly or indirectly benefit from definitely controlling things that would be a lot more problematic if they if there were no wasps sure um and e and that even goes for the the social wasps many of the yellow jacket species that nest above ground uh, the ones that nest underground many of them are scavengers not not all of them but they're the ones that are going to harass you at picnics and that come streaming out of their nest when you run the lawnmower over them unwittingly, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, well, maybe we should start by saying, well, how can we mitigate yeah. our conflicts with them? Yes. Uh, you know, number one, if, if, it's, if you suddenly notice a nest of wasps and it hasn't been a problem up until then, it's not going to be a problem for the rest of the time. Uh, so just let it be. Just let it be and i make an exception for people who have a hypersensitivity to, to insect venoms or a compromised mm. immune system sure uh, yeah. that could be a life-threatening situation and and you do what you need to do uh if you're an average person that doesn't have you know a able-bodied person that doesn't have that a susceptibility let them be i mean i remember one time <laughs> we had a, a camellia tree right next to our front porch when when i lived in oregon and and when fall came, we started pruning and there was a hornet nest in there, a bald faced hornet nest in there that we never knew about. And by then it, it would be, become completely abandoned. So it was of no consequence by then. But it's like, yeah, sometimes you don't even know the thing is there. Uh, so, you know, if you do notice a nest, you know, just steer clear of it as best you can. Mm -hmm. If it's not causing a problem, let it go. Because, you know, in the Northern hemisphere, at least, they're not going to be a year round thing. They go through cycles and by October uh, they're going to be done. Right. Um, okay. So, so that's one thing. Number two, if you're serving food outdoors, never serve beverages in cans or opaque glasses, because if, if a yellow jacket crawls in there, you're not going to know it. And if you gulp that thing down, it doesn't matter if you're allergic to venom or not, that could be a life threatening situation if your throat swells up right yeah so, yeah um yeah so so be beware of how you're serving beverages if, if you're if you're serving food you know cover it when you're not eating it uh so that discourages uh yellow jackets from from picking up your hamburger and carting it off to their <laughs> nest that kind of thing um 
that's happened to me by the way. So. <laughs> um, Not the entire thing, of course, if, if that need to be said. And yeah, if you, if you're, you'll go before you operate lawn mowers and, and other uh, uh, motorized uh, garden things, um, mm-hmm. go around your yard and, and make sure there isn't a nest of underground nest of yellow jackets that you're going to run over because vibrations are going to cause them to come out in force uh, to defend their nest. Uh, so basically the social wasps are the only ones where we need to mitigate conflict. Every other wasp that we've been talking about is solitary. It's interested only in getting food for its offspring, making a nest. Uh, sometimes that'll be in your window frame, a rivet's missing and it's gonna use that hole as a, as a nest. That's not a problem. There's going to be zero conflict there. Um, it's just going about its business. The other wasps that 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 look like cicada killers, okay, they're digging. They're very large wasps. They dig burrows in the ground so big that it looks like a gopher's been at work. Right? Again, the female is busy digging her burrow, finding cicadas to feed to her offspring. But the males, which remember, don't have stingers or don't have a sting, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, they are territorial and they behave very aggressively, chasing away any intruder, including people uh, from from this area where they can, they're protecting the female that they're interested in or females. Uh, And and so they're they're perched, they're alert, they're gonna fly out at things. Um, That's just their male territoriality, they can't, sting if 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 you find a wasp behaving in that way it's a male no worries okay yeah Um, so it it, yeah it it, but again we haven't been good at educating people about these differences in in behaviors and how to interpret them if you walk up to a paper wasp nest and suddenly one standing on tiptoe with its wings flared that means back off okay so you know it's if you can learn the body language and behavior of some of these things. Yeah, it's a little bit of work to do that, but you can easily say, okay, all right, I need to keep my distance now. Yeah. Uh, or, oh, that's just a male. I don't have to worry about that. So a lot of males will, uh, when they first come out, they're they're uh, flying low over the ground looking for females that before they emerge even from their burrows. And so it can look like it's a swarm, but it's just males trying to find females. Mm. So, you know, we, we just misinterpret a lot of these behaviors as signs of aggression or, you know, they're out to get us when that's the furthest thing from their minds. They're looking for the opposite sex or they're looking for a host uh, or prey or they're looking for flowers to feed, uh, get nectar from, that kind of thing. So, and that, that and they're, ser- yeah, they're, they're serving, us, ser- serving us in the sense of being agents of pest control for things that could be a lot more problematic, like flies uh, that that can spread uh, uh, diseases and things like that. I see fairly regularly some statistics and things that are alarming at minimum and and uh, bring about a, a cascading sense of, of doom <laughs> in relation to the future of things and, and insects and things. And I know that sounds very dramatic, um, but you know, I, I see lots of reports about different insect declines and things like that. And how are wasp, I, and I know that it's a very diverse group, but how are wasp faring? Um, and what are the kind of big leading causes of, of these declines? Uh, very good question. I, th- in my own experience, I see wasp and, and insects in general. I see uh, diversity as relatively stable, at least for the time being. I see abundance way down, but that can vary drastically from year to year. I mean, climate change is now responsible for these weather extremes from one year to another. Uh, Right now, as we're recording this, there's major flooding in some parts of the country, major droughts in other parts of the country. We're going, we've had the hottest temperatures on record for several consecutive days of a week or so ago. So we're seeing these, these extremes. And, and what I think the, the fear is, is that it's going to 
throw off the the phenology of these things. And, and by phenology, we mean when certain species appear, when when certain flowers bloom, when uh, certain insects emerge to pollinate them, that that that's going to become thrown off. And so the the flower will bloom and there won't be anything to pollinate it or the insect will emerge and it won't be able to find its host. Uh, those are legitimate fears because the unpredictability of when these events will occur and where they will occur is, is really, it makes it impossible to, to extrapolate when things are happening, when, when years are so different in terms of, you know, in one place, they can be radically different from one year to the next. That's, that's very troubling. Uh, what are, uh, besides climate change, what are, what are the other things that are contributing to insect decline? Continued use of pesticides. We can, as homeowners and business people, we can decide immediately, we're not going to do that anymore, at least outdoors. You know, indoors, if you have an issue, try and address that in a, with biological controls if you can. There are increasingly more options for that. Uh, but outdoors, please do not use chemicals. And that includes herbicides, fungicides, fertilizers. If you need fertilizers to make something grow, it shouldn't be growing there in the first place. Yeah. Um, all of this is going to go into the groundwater at some point or be blown on the wind when you apply it. So it's not going to be confined to your little piece of property either. What else? The industrial scale of agriculture is not sustainable either. The, the trends I really like, let's talk about some trends that, that are really good. Yeah. Um, so give, give people some hope here. Community gardens mm -hmm. and urban farming, I really like this because it's taking agriculture back from the corporate uh, realm and making it much more personable. It's a community building event. You're literally working uh, shoulder to shoulder with your neighbor, getting your hands dirty. Um, neighborhood gardens and urban farming solves food desert problems in a lot of places where where it, food is otherwise uh, difficult to access. Uh, so there's a lot of great things happening with that. Be because the scale is so much smaller, there's less risk in experimenting too. So uh, you know if you if your garden happens to fail with whatever thing you tried out, that's okay because your neighbors will have food that they can share with you. Uh, and when you have a success, you can learn from that. And next year, everybody's succeeding. So there's a lot of good that's happening at a small scale with, with, with urban farming and, and community gardens. Um, I like the trend towards landscaping with native plants. I recommend reading things from Doug Tallamy, Douglas Tallamy, uh, Bringing Nature Home is one of, one of his his key books, and Nature's Best Hope, I think, is his latest book. Benjamin Vogt, uh, he is a landscape architect who is almost single-handedly uh, changing the landscape of the Midwest by putting prairies in place of lawns. Uh, his book is Prairie Up, and A New Garden Ethic is his, his other one. He's an accomplished writer. In fact, that's that's what his degree is in, um, but he's he's taking what he's preaching and he's practicing it. So there's a lot of reason for hope. If we start adopting some of these uh, models that are currently existing and proliferating them, I, I like where we're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that that is it is a good point because um, you know sometimes you see these things, these big these big studies that come out and and the figures that come mm -hmm. out, and it can get overwhelming. And, you know, I've, I've had it with high school students in particular, high school students, a lot of people seem to think that the youth today, you know, like are, you know, disrespectful and they don't care and blah, 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 blah. And in my experience with like my high school students, they are passionate about the environment. They want to see change. You know, they, they want to know what they can specifically do. Don't tell me like, you know, something vague. I want to know specifically what is it that I can do. And, yeah. and to see sometimes they get so disheartened, um, you know, see a headline or something like that. And they're coming and they're saying, is it really that much of a decline? And what, and what, what am I supposed to do about that? And how am I supposed to have hope for the future? Um, 
and yeah, I think, yeah, it, sometimes it's focusing on that local community stuff, especially. I mean, that's the stuff that you have a hand in. It's the stuff that you can participate in. It's the, what you can grow, sometimes quite literally. Um, so yeah, I know I, I, I've appreciated a lot of those, those trends as well. Um, I, I'm seeing more people doing things like, um, you know, clover in their backyards and stuff like that, mm-hmm. rather than, than grass. And if, you know, they have other things growing and they're just kind of like, Oh yeah, you know, and just let it go. And, um, Hey, it's less maintenance anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, clo- I, clover that stuff is great. Yeah. I mean, clover fixes nitrogen. I mean, it's a good thing to have. It'll, it'll make the other plants, uh, grow better. So yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, we've, you know, we've allowed, uh, industry and media to uh, to frame our expectations and our 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 you know what we're supposed to appreciate, and that's not good for anything but majority shareholders. Okay, um, yeah. So if you know if you want what's good for you, you have to define that for yourself, mm-hmm. and it, we can be informed by the science behind it, which is why uh, Doug Talamy is a good read. He's proven his own points. He and his students, uh, you know, this is not something they're pulling out of their butts. You know, this is stuff that they've proven yeah. through research. So, uh, yeah, embracing science and then you know using it in the in the fashion that that delivers something good for you is, is the key, I think. And and you know, I mean, hopefully we can come to a consensus as to to what is good uh, instead of letting external forces uh, dictate that. That's why we need community building kinds of things. We need diversity, right, Equ- equity, and, mm-hmm. and inclusion because uh, we're not as as an old white guy. I'm not seeing <laughs> everything I should be because I have white privilege, mm-hmm. and I'm not threatened by the idea that the input from other sources that have been oppressed and suppressed is a bad thing. I think it's going to be uplifting. Yeah. Yeah. I I think, yeah, a a base value thing should be that if you are impacted, then you have a voice, you know, and what, and whatever it is that, that is going on. Um, I think, I think, uh, uh, things like bugs life too, you know, the old Pixar movie have had an impact (laughs) on people too, you know, thinking, thinking about the, the power of unification and, Honestly, yeah, mm-hmm. you look at communal insects and things and the the putting the good of the community over, you know, individual self. It's not necessarily like I need to survive, but I'm doing things to make sure that my community persists. Um, yeah, all, all good lessons, all good lessons that you can get straight from nature. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll keep you posted. I appreciate so much your time this morning and the conversation. I feel so enlightened. I feel Aww. so like absolutely blown away. I want to go outside and look for things like, and, and I'm <laughs> hoping that when people Good. listen, that that's kind of the attitude that they, that they walk away with. So, Oh yeah. Put, um, put, yeah. Add that when you ent- enter your own introductions, because that's, that's the goal. That's totally the yeah. goal. Get people yeah. looking at things, looking at them differently. So yeah. Oh, a hundred percent, 110% for that. I'm thrilled by the invitation. Cause I've, I've, I've had my eye on you for a while and I thought, Oh, I'd really like to get on that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but and, I mean, you know, the best hosts are like you. They're very conversational. They're 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 passionate about learning, and 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 then sharing that with other people. And I I'm so grateful that this format exists, mm-hmm. and that there's people like you doing it, and Ali Ward, and yeah. So uh, yeah, please keep up the great work. And if there's anything I can do to help promote you, just wasps are word. so much more than the familiar yellow jackets and hornets that harass picnickers and build nests under the eaves of our homes. These amazing, mostly solitary creatures thrive in nearly every habitat on Earth, and their influence on our lives is overwhelmingly beneficial. Wasps are agents of pest control in agriculture and gardens. They are subjects of study in medicine, engineering, and other important fields. Wasps pollinate flowers, engage in symbiotic relationships with other organisms, and create architectural masterpieces in the form of their nest. From minute fairy flies to gargantuan tarantula hawks, wasps exploit almost every niche on the planet. So successful at survival that other organisms emulate their appearance and behavior. The sting is the least reason to respect wasps, and no reason to loathe them either. 
one more thank you to Eric Eaton for being a guest on today's episode. I, I appreciated his time more than words could possibly describe. It was a solid almost two hour conversation that I have had to condense for this episode. And it was unfortunate that I had to cut certain pieces because it was just genuinely, genuinely. And I, I don't say this just to sound like, oh, you know, I'm just, no, genuinely one of my favorite conversations that I have had for the show. Eric is a treasure. And of course, thank you for listening, for being here, for sticking around to the end. Be sure to check out the episode notes for extras and links to some additional resources, images, videos, as well as Eric's socials and links to his books. Because again, he's got a lot. And I highly, highly recommend Wasp, the astonishing diversity of a misunderstood insect. That's all for today. If you're interested in learning more about how to support the show, you can do that at patreon.com slash the wildlife. And with that, peace out, rainbow trouts.